Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Corporate Pension Fund Live Trade Street Review and Winner Announcement Webinar. Today's speakers are Dr. Thomas Wiki and Dr. Renee Zhang. Thomas Wiki is the VP of Data Science at Quantopian. He did his PhD at Brown University building computational models of the brain. He is the co-author of the popular probabilistic programming package PyMC3. Renee Zhang is the Director of Data Science at Quantopian. She holds a PhD in Applied Mathematics from Tufts University, specializing in tensor algebra, numerical analysis, and image processing. She joined Quantopian in 2016 and worked on building Quantopian's risk model, feature factory, and statistical selection of trading strategies. There's a link to the forum post for the challenge in the description of this video, uh, where you can ask um, any remaining questions to members of the community. Thank you so much, Renee and uh, Thomas. With that, let's get started. Cool, well, thank you for the introduction, Saba. Thank you all for tuning in. I'm very excited to be here. I hope you're all staying safe and staying home in these challenging times. I um, wanted to introduce uh, and give a chance for her to say hi, uh, Quantopian's Director of Data Science Extraordinaire, back due to popular demand, uh, and the person that's actually done all this work that we're going to talk about here. So, Renee, do you want to say hi? Thank you, Thomas. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. And we're happy to be here with you guys and uh, Thomas to talk about our first 30 third party challenge. Yeah, indeed. So, um, we are very excited about this particular challenge for multiple reasons. One is, uh, it's the first one that we did with a third party, a large US corporate pension fund. And uh, they uh, worked together with us on this and we're looking for something that is most diversifying to the existing algorithm. So that was the new challenge for uh, this uh, research challenge that we put out. And uh, as we will see, um, the submissions have been uh, amazing. So uh, we couldn't be happier with all of this. So with that uh, out of the way, let's get started. The objectives were rather broad for this challenge, uh, and that was definitely intentional. So where before we were very focused, now it was more asking you to really be creative and just bring your top factors uh, whatever they may be. So uh, intentionally, there were very low requirements just to get more broad exposure. The basic rules were, well, at least 100 assets in the QTU. Um, the turnover, uh, this was different, where we now also had a lower limit. So before, we always said, oh, turnover should be as low as possible. But definitely, there are different types of strategies, right? And for certain types, you want more, to, you, you sometimes want strategies that ha just have inherently higher turnover. So that is what we're, we're looking for here in the range of 5 to 20%. And also different from other challenges, uh, there are no constraints of risk exposure or beta to spy. So as long as um, it's for full seeds requirements, the risk exposures don't, don't matter here as much. Uh, the only key is that they are time bearing. So things that trade uh, the time certain risk factors are totally fine. So if you have an algorithm that is going long and short momentum at different times because it has the that is where it's deriving its alpha from, and that is totally fine. So these tilts just need to move, but they, they can't be positive. And the selection criteria were mainly the specific sharp ratio over the first five days. Starting with some summary statistics, the number of submissions were just shy of 400, uh, which is incredible, by far the most number of submissions we've gotten for any challenge. So uh, you guys really knocked it out of the park there, uh, which was really cool to see. And just so not only the quantity, but as we will see also the quality of the submissions. So that that is really amazing. And then here is a breakdown, as we usually do, for each individual user, how many the algorithm was submitted. We don't have a cap on how many you submit. So if you have many great ideas, if you have many similar ideas, that's fine too. If you post updates on individual algorithms, we filter out highly correlated ones. So that's no problem. Um, so Arun uh, was very active with 41 submissions. Your team as well. Uh, Kyle, um, 
also up there. So great to see um, our A team come back. Um, also, um, people who've done our Learn from the Experts videos. So uh, you should definitely check those out. The first thing that we look at is the QT coverage. So just almost everyone had all their all their stocks in the QTU, very basic. And then, of course, we are looking at correlations. And these, as you can see, they're definitely clusters, these pockets of very high correlation. Also, there are certain, maybe let's call them sectors, where algorithms tend to have similar return patterns, but overall the correlations weren't. Uh, overall the correlations are low, um, but they're definitely these broader patterns. So there is some uh, crowding going on, which is not that surprising given that, well, certain types of strategies are just more famous and easier to create than others. Uh, but yeah, well, there are also these in here, for example, which are just very uncorrelated to anything else. So these are just the correlations between all the submissions. Next, let's look at the correlation with the benchmark return. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we provided you with a set of returns to be most diversified to. So that was the uniqueness score that you saw at the top. And we provided the returns in an obfuscated way. Uh, so here we're computing the cor correlation directly with it. The two are very similar. And this is the histogram of that. So this basically shows how correlated are all the algorithms. So it's a histogram over um, to these specific benchmark returns that were provided to us from the third party. And you can see that it's you managed to be f f diversified, but of course, these were pretty broad factors. So it is difficult to uh, be completely uncorrelated to anything that's out there. And But overall, so this shows um, the correlations are quite low and especially there's nothing that is really very correlated. So in sum, you can definitely take something from here and construct something that will be very diversifying to the existing return streams. So the next thing that Rene did was to apply hierarchical clustering. Um, Rene, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Sure. So basically, uh, we use a correlation among the different angles to do the clustering. So we have a threshold use point two. Um, what it means is uh, the angles has uh, um, correlation higher than actually 0.8, they will be uh, clustered, uh, uh, put in one cluster. And uh, you can see um, there are a uh, number of clusters and uh, um, we uh, also you can see um, most uh, for most clusters, we, we uh, the angles with Designed by the same same author, uh, in the in in one cluster, but uh, for some of the cluster, um, we have different users, uh, like this one. And uh, um, the good thing is we do have a number, a large number of clusters here. Wow, yeah, that is a lot of clusters. So that essentially mirrors the um, what we saw with the correlation matrix that uh, a lot of the algorithms were quite um, correlated to each other. So that is just reflected here in the clustering. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, maybe just one more note. So this is the dendrogram, which is always weird to read, but basically the shorter the line between two numbers is, so every one down here is an algorithm, and the shorter the distance on the y-axis is, the more correlated they are. So everything in here is a pocket of algorithms that are 
more than 80% correlated all of them. So this is the result of the hierarchic clustering. Cool, okay, so well, I guess then the next step is once we identify these different clusters, we'll want to select the cluster winners. And here we did things a little bit differently. Um, so there are a couple of metrics um, that we used. Uh, Renee, do you also want to talk about this? Uh -huh. So um, yeah. So in in this analysis, we use uh, um, measurement about uh, stability. Um, here you can see we compute the rolling sharp ratio first. So the window we use is one year. Um, then we we compute uh, the stability by using the maximum value of the rolling sharp ratio minus the minimum value of the rolling sharp ratio to um, basically have a sense of how stable the sharp sharp ratio stays. So yeah, that is a new measure and. Um, I, th I think that really clever. So I really in, enjoyed looking at that. So it really just measures the, the spread of your rolling sharp ratio over time. Uh -huh. um, so then next, there's a couple of other things that we rank people on. Um, and I should also add, this is purely the ranking that we're doing for uh, finding the winners. Uh, the analysis that we're doing together with the third party is completely separate from this. So here we're just looking for the winners and the, uh, uh, the, the prizes that we kind of um, put out. So there's a couple of things that go into that ranking. One is the sharp ratio, then the number of positions, the turnover, or the turnover time series, the 95th percentile of the turnover. So what is your uh, on the high end, um, what is your turnover? Then this is the uniqueness score. So this is how correlated you are to the benchmark returns. This is from this histogram up here. So essentially, that, yeah, that is the, um, the that was the target. So the the uniqueness score that we also showed in the test sheet, and then this new stability metric that Renee has devised. Then we rank them. And then we compute an aggregate score for all the items. So, so far we have done no filtering down to the clusters or anything. This is computed for all the items. And you can see the weighting that we did. Um, so 40% comes from the sharp ratio, 10% from the number of positions, 10% from the turnover rank, 20% from the uniqueness score, and 20% from the stability rank. Um, and I know that Renee has tried a lot of different things, how to compute these rankings. And after a long um, deliberation and very careful assessment, uh, this is what she concluded on being the best one. And I, I agree with her. So this definitely gives the best ranking of the algorithms that uh, we could come up with and also the most fair ones. Um, one note also on the out of sample. So we asked you to submit algorithms on a certain time period and said, well, we are also going to take into account the out of sample, which we are doing. So the time range that we ran this over is, I think, from 2014 up until like a week ago. So this includes the in sample time period, it includes the mm, hold up period, which is at 2018 to 2020. And then it also includes true out of sample, which is since the last submission was made, one month has passed, right? So uh, the deadline is one month ago, which is also included. And Renee tried all kinds of different ways of maybe seeing like how should we include the out of sample and how should we include the, uh, the true out of sample that we have and hold out. So here, what we ended up doing is include the whole time period and have that. So this in this is several benefits. One of them is that it levels the playing field. So um, people who use data sets that might have not been available in this time period 
would have other been otherwise been at a disadvantage to someone who might use the uh, just prices we, we could backtest further. And well, of course, we have the one month of out of sample, of true out of sample as well. Uh, but of course, that's just one month, and as we all know, very different market regimes from before. So just because that is noisy, um, weighting that overly heavily, um, I think also is not going to be fair. So this is basically what we came up with: is just taking the whole time period into account, which has in sample holdout and um, true out of sample together. So um, and the results also show that the algorithms that end up winning perform well in all these time periods, which is, of course, what you would want. Do you have anything to add to that, Renee? Mm -hmm. So the score, uh, the measurement score is this average specific sharp ratio. That is, so um, first day, third day, day, and fifth day. So the average. Ah, yes, thanks for adding that. So the, yeah, got it. Um, and yeah, so I guess we'll, I'll repeat that when we look at the tear sheets where it will become more clear. Um, so once we have all the scores and the total rank, then we go through all the individual clusters and then select the cluster winner from using the total rank. So last time uh, we used only the sharp ratio and we've gotten some very valid feedback that uh, actually it should be the rank, right? That is used to select the cluster winner. And that is what we've done here. So essentially, we go into each of those clusters and then just pick the best one by that aggregate score that we have computed. And well, for most clusters, because they're all based on the same person, that will just narrow it down to reduce highly correlated ones. Uh, but if you had unique submissions, like you can see veteran here, uh, then those will still count and um, allow you to win more than one prize, and we definitely have that. Um, but then there's also um, clusters where people have done similar things where only the best out of that cluster will be chosen. So um, that is also what we did last time already, where we definitely also want to reward orthogonal thinking and more creative ideas. So if some if a factor can be discovered by separate people who are not working together, that is definitely something where the expectation would be that it's might not be, might not have the highest alpha, just because if say five people come up with the same idea, then uh, well, more people at other funds can come up with that idea too. And uh, probably it's a it's an idea that has already been discovered. So this is an interesting proxy to use. And actually, a really cool thing that we at Quantopian can do, just because we have this huge breadth of algorithms, is to use this as essentially discovering crowding, right? So if a lot of different people come up with the same idea, well, we definitely can see that on in our database. Um, but that's only because we have um, such a big crowdsource database. That's just an aside. OK, so then, uh, drum roll, we have the winners. So that is the, the main, this is the total rank, um, which is the average of all of them. And just ranked by, um, yeah, by the, by the aggregate score. So the first winner um, receiving a $1,000 prize is Kyle M. And we will look at the individual tear sheets as well. but. That one was really outstanding. Um, so, and Kyle has also done an expert, uh, learn from the expert video, so he's well known. And uh, yeah, so congratulations, Kyle, on getting the first prize. That's really uh, an amazing achievement. Uh, second prize is veteran Rusman, of course, uh, who we all know and love. Um, the first one to do the learn from the experts video. Uh, so, congratulations. Uh, Oleg is has two submissions, which won third and fourth prize. So both of those get rewarded with $1,000 each. Um, then veteran Rusman again, got one, another one. Um, and then your key. So those are the uh, one, two, three, four, five. Ah, so these are the top five. Um, and then 
the next 10 get $500 each. Um, so that is Joachim, of course, you know, Indigo Monkey, congratulations. Again, Joachim, Daniel Carabini, I think also someone who we've seen in previous channels, Joachim, uh, coming in strong again. Uh, Yark, Larson, congratulations, Radian Hawk, Vladimir, Leo M, and Mirage Solodia. So you all won a prize in this, in the most competitive challenge we've ever taken out. So um, yeah, this is really quite an accomplishment and um, I'm very excited about all of these. And um, this will only be improved by looking at the actual individual tear sheets, which are also probably the, the strongest we've seen in any of the um, challenges so far. So we had 11 um, unique winners, which is a ratio I'm happy with. So now let's look at the individual tear sheets. So the first prize, Kyle M, you can see, um, I, I have no idea how he did that, but uh, he did. So over a, a six year time period, including true out of sample, and um, he also actually used a data set which had a, a proper holdout included. So, um, here, yeah, we can see over the first five days, uh, both the total and specific sharp ratio are just off the chart. And the return plot also look just incredible, right? And also, so this basically, this last mm, couple of millimeters in this plot are the true out of sample. So you can see in this COVID-19 pandemic time, uh, this factor worked incredibly well. Um, I guess uh, this time I didn't really talk yet about how to read these plot, this plot, so I'm just gonna introduce that real quick. So here on the first inlay, we have the information ratio, which is uh, basically the specific shop ratio. Um, so, but we have it for, so you can just think of this at the shop ratio for the total and the specific returns. Um, and we're not only looking at the sharp ratio of the back test that you usually would get if you were to run this in our IDE, but we're also delaying that trading signal by one, two, three, four, and five days, and you can go even further, of course. The idea behind that delay is that we want to know if there is a trading delay, right? So maybe there's a turnover constraint. Uh, so when you run these factors, in reality, you don't always trade into all the positions on the very first day. So it's um, it's common to have a bit of a lag when you trade these factors. So what you want to know is, well, how quickly does that alpha evaporate if it takes us, say, five days to completely go into that portfolio, right? So by that time, the positions that we had a five day stale, is there still any juice left? And as you can see here, well, even if we only managed to slowly ramp over the course of five days into the full portfolio of this individual factor. Of course, it will be part of an aggregate, so the final portfolio will look different, but it's comp comprised of all these individual ones to influence that. Then there's still an expected sharp ratio based on this backtest um, of over three. So that is, that's excellent. Um, then here the plot is also for the total, there's the cumulative returns total and specific over time. And this just is this the same returns that make up this plot, right? So for one day, two day, three day, four day. And here we're looking for are they, how consistent are the returns? So this is similar to the uh, consistency score that Rene described above. And here you can see in this case, of course, it's just uh, I mean, there's like mini, mini drawdown down here, but overall it's incredibly consistent. Um, and it doesn't just all derive all its returns, say in um, 2015 and then it's flat or something. And it's here, of course, also in the holdout period and the out of sample, we can see that it didn't just flatten out. So yeah, this is like um, good stuff. And here we can see that these are now the risk exposures. And it's not just a single value because, well, the risk exposures change over time. So these are the daily risk exposures of all these different risk factors, volatility, short, reversal, short-term, and then just a box plot of that. 
So this means that on a single day, for example, there was a reversal short-term exposure of minus 0.06. Um, so this just tells you that here, well, we don't know when that was, right? So this aggregates across time, but we do know that, well, there was actually overall, the exposures are very, very low. Um, makes me a little bit concerned that the maybe the optimizer was used, but um, nonetheless, it didn't seem to uh, destroy any of the alpha. Um, so it's, it's, it's well behaved in that regard. Um, if it did, I would still be interested in seeing the original factor if that exists. So, um, but, but regardless of that, so um, here we can see that it definitely, uh, well, this scale is very low. So it's, it's it very rarely dips into any risk sources at all. But if it does, then mostly it's going long and short, reverse the short term. And here, um, it'll be clear in other more other plots. So maybe let's go down to um, the next one, which I'm going to show in more detail as well, but just to look for something which is a bit more variability. So for example, volatility, The this black line here is the median value. So here we can see, well, there's a very, very slight positive tilt to volatility, but overall, the volatility exposure is varying over time. So there is some timing of that risk factor going on which is in line with what we described uh, as some of um, the rules of this factor, right? That uh, it's fine to have risk exposures as long as they vary over time. And that is what we can see here. So um, next we can see, well, actually I'm gonna explain it here. Um, the cumulative returns, just in total aggregate for the total returns, the specific returns, and then all the other risk sources. So this just tells us, okay, where do the returns actually come from? And here, well, because this one also has very low risk exposure, maybe I'll find a better one. Um, well, let's uh, take this one, for example. So this one, for example, has a lower, um, it's also changing its volatility exposure, but it um, is it does have a short volatility tilt. And we can see then next, well, does it get paid for that um, timing and tilt of this volatility exposure? So that is what we're looking for with the cumulative returns here. And here we can see, well, yes, it does. Um, and that is contributing to the common returns as well. So this is just the aggregate. Um, so yeah, it's getting paid on the volatility exposures that it goes long and short. Um, the momentum, uh, actually this is technology, very low, right? So this is not really something important, but just to drive home the point of what the logic behind this is, um, this is distracting a little bit the timing of the tech sector. And then here we're just looking at the volatility of these. So then these bottom two plots show the number of holdings. So these should be above 100, but of course higher is better um, for multiple reasons. One is, well, it's more difficult to overfit large factors uh, with many positions. Factors with many positions also give us more leeway in how to work with these factors and maybe um, yeah, extract more uh, information from it and uh, give us more directions to move in. So it's a utility thing. And then in red, we have overlaid the turnover. And uh, yeah, that was supposed to be between five and 20%. So you can see here, it's, it's doing that. Um, so uh, yeah, this is a good example. And then the last one is long short percent holdings. And this just tells you the distribution of your holdings over time. So we take the percentiles of the weights in your factor every day. So if you just plot the, uh, say, histogram of the weight of the factor scores every day, right? That'll be maybe, well, what, that is the question, what type of distribution that looks like. Ideally, it looks similar to a normal distribution. And then if you take just the fifth percentile, the 25th percentile, the median, the fifth percentile, and um, the 75th and the 95th percentile, then on a normal distribution, you will see that 
these all have nice separability. Um, so that means that there are values in here that are very negative, a lot of them that are slightly less negative, and then on average, they're zero, and on the other side, the same thing. And what this tells us is that this is a nice the constructed factor that has sensitivity built in. So higher factor scores mean that the factor is more confident in this stock going up than in another one with a lower factor score that is closer to zero. So this is really what we're looking for. And one of the reasons why we included this is that, uh, so I haven't seen this in a long time because um, you guys are really good at learning and updating your method to include this. But back in the day, what we looked at, a lot of them just were completely equal weighted. So there was no sensitivity in the weights whatsoever. And uh, that's why this is in there, and it's really been helpful. So that's the logic of how to read those tear sheets, just so we know what we're looking for. Um, so yeah, here we can see, well, let's go back to Kyle's. Um, turnover is really nicely behaved. It has a very large portfolio, and also these weights are very well behaved. So yeah, this is like picture perfect. Then uh, veterans factor, so that's with a probably of 2.5. And here we can see that the, well, I mean, the specific is almost the total, but uh, here we can definitely see that there's a little bit of volatility coming from the common returns, which is totally fine, right? So this is in line with what we were asking for. And um, so this is actually really good to see that he indeed was changing the exposures over time. Um, so there's a little bit of factor timing going on, but most of the returns are still coming from just specific returns in alpha. Um, and also here, interestingly, we see, well, this one also does really, really well in the COVID-19 pandemic. So in the true out of sample. So I think that's, I'm really happy to see that um, the winning algorithms all, uh, not all of them, but most of them um, stand well the test of time in a very different and very challenging market regime. So here, um, the next winner, Ole, is the same. Um, so you can see that the biggest determination determiner is indeed the sharp ratio, just because by now the factors are all so well constructed that few points are getting taken off by uh, having a large portfolio, because most of you now have a large portfolio and know how to control turnover very well and also how to build um, nicely distributed sensitive signals. Um, here we definitely see a little bit more of um, exposures, but not to the point where it would be problematic. Um, and of course, then when combining these, whatever ways, a lot of these um, issues can go um, away. Next one is Oleg, um, the second contribution. Um, so yeah, um, again, this has a little bit lower sharp ratio, but overall still looks really, really good. And here we can also see that it is uh, different in its exposure profile from the previous submission. I mean, we know that just that the returns are uncorrelated, um, but yeah, so this one has more of a, it's still changing its momentum exposure, but it has this positive tilt, um, which this one didn't really have, so this one was more on the short volatility side. So then just going a little bit quicker, just because a lot of them um, are um, now, I'm just starting to look a little bit similar. Uh, this is veterans, next submission. Again, um, this one does really, really well in the pandemic, which of course he couldn't have known when he wrote it. Um, and uh, this one does have uh, definitely exposures. It's still changing it over time, but um, has some tilts. And, um, and that is definitely increasing volatility and on, on aggregate, the common returns are also positive. So. Um, the factor is getting paid um, on those tilts and timing of those tilts. Um, 
Cool. So, um, look, Hughes, this one looks really good. Um, although he and the holdout, it's not as performing, but then the true out of sample, actually, that's also um, a spike. Legal Monkey. Um, this one also has quite a nice profile. Definitely does have a nice run over here towards the end of 2019. And well, as we all know, 2019 has been a really challenging time for most quant factors. So the fact that these are doing well in this holdup period is really reassuring. Um, Renee, is there anything uh, you want to interject? Um, no, actually, yeah, every time I looking at uh, this tier sheet, I feel I really enjoy reading them because those factors are very interesting. You can see. Uh, not only the performance as strong, but also the they have different ideas, and uh, um, so you can uh, you can figure out from this uh, uh, risk exposure profile. You can see okay, people are um, trying different ideas, and these different ideas actually work well. That's really uh, enjoying to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's well said. Um... I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I mean, just looking at the intellectual curiosity and um, and intelligence behind all this work is uh, is, is mind blowing. Yeah, um, and yeah, I mean, just the, the quantity of this, right? So you just put this out there, and then um, people from the internet show up and build like incredible things. So it's really exciting. Um, yeah, so this one also, yeah, you can really see how different the profiles are and the different kind of things that people did. Um, so, yeah, just browsing through the rest of them. Um, this is Bjork's one. I also really liked this one. Um, and we have said this many times that um, even though the weighting definitely favors factors that have a high shop ratio, nonetheless, um, these strategies that have a sharp ratio more in the, let's say, 1 to 1.5 regime, or maybe even 0.5, right, are still really interesting. And combining them together adds diversification and, um, and boosts the final factor. So it shouldn't all be about just maxing out. Uh, and if it's not sharp ratio 3, then it's worthless. So um, that's why I really enjoy this one. Uh, it doesn't have an insanely high shop ratio, but it holds up really well over time. Um, and and interestingly, it seems to do something with healthcare here. So I'd be curious to hear um, what uh, what the idea behind that is. So Bjark, if you hear this, definitely let us know. Um, and uh, yeah, so here actually we do see that this is um, suffering from that equal weighting that I mentioned before. So here I would invite Bjark to um, see what is squashing this, if there's uh, maybe the optimizer that's being used or um, some other reason why these weights are equal weighted. So this is what we can see is if that line, if the, if the 95 and the 75 line are overlapping and on the other side as well, then it's an equally weighted portfolio. Um, Okay, Hawk, and yeah, so VM, great submission, uh, Mirage, also, yeah, I mean, just solid. Um, so it's it really incredible that there is so, um, yeah, so many algorithms that still, if you go down to like uh, the 15th one, after heavy filtering, um, there's still like really good stuff there, so. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed. Um, so, of course, this webinar wouldn't be complete without showing how these factors work together. I should say that this is just an extremely simple way of really just taking them, averaging them together. There's no constraints on turnover or any other sort of cleverness. Um, so this is really just a very first cut of, well, what happens if we just throw them together? Of course, uh, ideally, you want to be a little bit more clever about how you combine them so there's a lot more that goes into that combination process. 
But anyway, it's interesting to look at even just this uh, because it really gives you a sense of, well, the power of diversification, right? Um, so this is the combined factor. And well, you can see it's, um, it looks kind of amazing. Uh, so it has a sharp range on the first day of four. And even then after many days, it doesn't drop below three. So this is better than each individual one, right? So it's better than the sum of its parts, which is exactly the nice effect of diversification. Um, yeah, it's just really nice <laughs> uh, in terms of cumulative return. So even the holdout and the true out of sample, it just keeps on chugging. Um, here we can see that it does have a momentum exposure. So this might be something that when you um, do combine it, um, to build an actual portfolio. Maybe you want to um, do something about that, maybe selecting different factors that would um, not increase the momentum exposure or um, have some ways of reining that in. But again, this is just a very first cut of um, combining the winners from the selecting criteria that we have. Uh, but even though it is changing that momentum exposure over time. So um, if um, yeah, if, if that is something um, that could be a target, right? If you say, well, some momentum exposure at, at the right time is actually a good thing, right? And momentum is known to work. So that's why it's a risk factor. Um, so, so yeah, that, that is one reason. And of course, putting everything together, the number of holdings is like, it's a really wide factor, it's, um, has nice sensitivity, and the turnover is just picture perfect in that target range where we would want it to have. So yeah, um, amazing how to like, take all this work um, and just imagining all the really cool ideas, right, that went into this and that this, uh, what this aggregate sort of is, is, is pulling off. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's, that, that was a lot of fun. Um, so Renee, any parting thoughts and then we want to go to questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm also very happy. Uh, among the scoring system I have tried, this one is a simple list one. And uh, with the simple list one, and uh, the algos we select are very um, promising. Um, I really like it. And as always, um, we encourage uh, our users to submit their ideas, even if your maybe the sharp ratio it doesn't look like it were super high, but uh, if that is your unique ideas, we encourage really encourage you to just uh, submit it. Um, and uh, we may uh, find uh, that is actually very useful to um, add as a diversification to our um, with our uh, other egos, and uh, then we, we could uh, use them to build a stronger uh, factor. Mm. Yeah. Um, and also just to highlight Renee's contribution here. Um, so she really went all out in trying all kinds of different ideas of how to weight them and select them. And uh, interestingly enough, the most straightforward, simplest one, uh, which is what we've shown here, worked by far the best. So I always like when that's the outcome where uh, a lot of complexity that gets built then can get collapsed again. Uh, to make something that is simple and thus robust. So um, I'm really happy with what we ended up with, and I'm really happy with the winners that were selected from this weighting scheme. So, um, Saba, are there any questions that we should address? Uh, there are currently no questions. Um, so I want to encourage people that are um, currently um, viewing, uh, if you have any questions, um, share them. Now, um, so I'll wait a couple minutes, and then if we don't get any questions, we can just um, go right into our outro. Um, so while we wait for that, maybe let's go back to the to the waiting scheme. Um, yeah, Renee, do you want to talk about any of the other waiting schemes you tried, or the ranking schemes? Whether there was anything that you learned? Uh, yeah, that's really <laughs> um, a lot. But uh, one thing I can share is uh, actually um, 
uh, the echoes from um, many many echoes. Uh, I think like uh, at least half of the echoes we select uh, appeared in different uh, screen ranking system. So even if we change like a different ranking system, the they still like uh, appear to be the top echoes. So that's also something I like. That means um, these echoes are strong, even with different ranking systems. They uh, can still be selected. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that the, the algorithms are robust to different weighting schemes. So it's not that you get a completely different type of result um, in selection of winners. Um, depending on how you skin the cat, which is also, yeah, very validating in, um, well, in the algorithms, but also in the, um, in this ranking that we ended up with. Um, there's one question asking for the GitHub location. I asked for clarification if it's for the current notebook, um, or what exactly um, they're asking. Um, right. So, well, they probably see the URL here. So this is our own private repo, um, which is not public. And um, and this notebook also isn't public. If you have a good reason, I mean, there's, I mean, I showed most of this. Um, so if you email either Renee or me, we might share with you. Um, we are not going to post it publicly, but um, yeah, if you just email us, um, we'll and, and tell us why you're interested. Um, we'll probably share it with you. Actually, there is one question that just came in. How do the returns compare with SP uh, five hundred? Do you want to take that one, Renee? Uh, I don't think uh, SP500 is the right benchmark um, because, as you can see, um, I think the algos, most of our submitted algos are long short uh, strategies. So they are basically um, not even market neutral, it's market almost neutral. So, um, uh, but uh, I think. Uh, <clears throat> Um, I think to be fair, um, like uh, among different uh, years, like uh, SP five hundred could be better, uh, have better performance uh, than the long short type of strategies. Uh, but uh, uh, you can see from some of selected algos, it has strong performance from uh, this February to um, this February to uh, March. That is when the market really goes down, and also you can see from the sharp ratio. You know the uh, SP five hundred sharp ratio is basically I think that is from one to two something, and uh, some of our algos has higher sharp ratios than the SP five hundred. But uh, um, I think in general we probably shouldn't compare those those uh, uh, use SP five hundred as a benchmark to compare. Mm -hmm. Right. Or uh, we only compare, compare it for the last month. <laughs> That's a joke. Um, OK, cool. OK, thank you, um, for everyone. thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Since there are no more questions, we're going to wrap up the Q&A port portion of the webinar. Um, if you have questions for Thomas and Renee that, has, that haven't been answered yet, you can post them in the comments of the forum post um, for this webinar. Um, which is linked to the description of this video. Uh, you can subscribe and press the notification bell to be notified when we post a new video. Thank you all for watching, and thank you to Thomas and Renee for presenting a great webinar, and have a great day.